to Pilgrim Congregational Church, UCC, on this beautiful morning as we celebrate Just Peace Sunday. I am Reverend Gloria Cox, Associate Pastor of Youth and Young Adults, and on behalf of everyone here at Pilgrim, I want to welcome you and say we are so glad that you are here. Just to avoid any confusion, uh, Pastor Michelle is still with us. Uh, she is just taking a, a day today to rest and recuperate from a big conference, a big retreat that she led during this week. So she will be back uh, next week and she'll be with us for two more weeks. In 1985, our denomination, the United Church of Christ, adopted the commitment to be a just peace church. And just peace is not a destination, but a path requiring awareness and constant vigilance to resolve existing and developing conflict in ourselves, our families, and our communities, and our world. Just peace envisions a renewed, vibrant, diverse and sustainable world free of violence. And just peace is grounded in God's activity in creation. Shalom is the vision that pulls all creation toward a time when weapons are no longer available and they're made into plows and all creatures lie down together without fear and dwell from want. A just peace calls us to build just peace with the earth. And for that reason, our focus on today, this Just Peace Sunday, is lament. We are called to mourn and acknowledge our complicity in environmental degradation so that we as a global population and as pilgrims may be catalyzed into more significant action. So together today, let us follow the voices of indigenous peoples and our youth who are leading us toward a more just and peaceful connection with the earth. The earth needs us and we need each other. Welcome, we are so glad you are here.
turn to our scripture readings, which there will be two today. The first is from the prophet Jeremiah, and I will be reading verses 11, in chapter 4, verses 11 and 12, and then go to uh, verse 22 through 28. Jeremiah, as you will remember, has been called by the Lord to give a message that uh, the people of Israel may not be that eager to hear, but it is an important message and one that still has resonance today. At that time it will be said to this people and to Jerusalem, a hot wind comes from me out of the bare heights in the desert toward my poor people, not to winnow or cleanse, a wind too strong for them. Now it is I who speak in judgment against them. For my people are foolish, they do not know me. They are stupid children, they have no understanding. They are skilled in doing evil, but do not know how to do good. I look on the earth, and lo, it was waste and void, and to the heavens, and they had no light. I looked on the mountains, and lo, they were quaking, and all the hills moved to and fro. I looked, and lo, there was no one at all, and all the birds of the air had fled. I looked, and lo, the fruitful land was a desert, and all its cities were laid in ruins before the Lord, before His fierce anger. For thus says the Lord, the whole land shall be a desolation, yet I will not make a fool of him. Because of this, the earth shall mourn, and the heavens above grow black, for I have spoken, I have purposed, I have not relented, nor will I turn back. There is, of course, good news. We find that in the New Testament, in the first of Paul's letters to Timothy, this is uh, 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 12 through 17, which happened to be printed also in a slightly different version than I'm reading on the back of your bulletin today. Growth in God's love. I am grateful to Christ Jesus, our Lord, who has strengthened me because he judged me faithful and appointed me to his service, even though I was formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor, and a man of violence. But I received mercy because I had acted ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord overflowed for me with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. The saying is sure and worthy, full of love, and worthy of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the foremost. Jesus Christ might display the utmost patience, making me an example to those who would come to believe in him for eternal life. To the King of the ages, immortal, invisible, the only God, the honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. The Word of God for the people of God. Jeremiah is a major figure in the Hebrew Scriptures, and he is personally one of my favorite prophets. The book of Jeremiah is the longest and most tumultuous prophetic writing in the Bible. It speaks of a nation under massive assault and a people of, whose lives are racked with pain. Jeremiah's role is to make a trumpet call to the community and to stir them up by shocking them into an awareness of the danger of where their destructive behavior is leading them. This is often part of the prophet job description, and while it's unpleasant for the prophet, it's equally unpleasant for those of us on the receiving end of the message. Perhaps that's why we tend to downplay or ignore or even try to discredit the prophets among us. After all, there have been instances of false prophets, so what are we to believe? In fact, Jeremiah has to contend with these 
false prophets who have continued to assure the people that everything is all right. When Jeremiah believes and knows that they are in imminent danger, it is urgent that he get their attention to make sure that they know about the looming threat, but more importantly, to ensure that they understand the reasons behind it. Because there's an important difference between knowing and understanding, although both are key for growth. Knowing is defined as the expertise and skills gained through experience or education. It includes facts and information, things about which we are certain, or believe that we are certain. Understanding, though, involves conceptualization and association. It's the awareness of the connection between pieces of information that are presented and it's essential in order to put knowledge into good use. The great crisis of Israel's history in the time of Jeremiah involved the destruction of the temple, the dwelling place of the Lord, and the exile of God's people. And Jeremiah proclaims that the cause of the crisis is that the people of God no longer know God. They don't understand what it means to be people of God, to act out God's love, and therefore all of creation must suffer. In other words, if you think things are bad now, just wait it can and will get much, much worse. Although Jeremiah's rhetoric may seem harsh, we too have prophets today who are calling to us with the same apocalyptic imagery. International panels on climate and biodiversity have for decades raised the alarm over the threat of irreversible levels of global warming. Every story in this week's edition of Time is about the climate crisis. One of only five times in the magazine's history that it's devoted the entire issue to a single topic. It's called 2050, The Fight for Earth. And as you read the stories, a clear trend emerges. We aren't doing enough. Whether that means stopping deforestation and ocean warming, reforming our manufacturing processes, or adapting to the changes already set in motion. And while there are varying opinions and perspectives on how dire the situation is, or how soon doomsday will be upon us, there are at least three things that we know to be true. First, life as we know it on this earth is getting more uncomfortable and less predictable. Weather is getting more extreme. Habitats on land and in the sea are changing, making them inhospitable for some species while letting others move in and take over. Some ecosystems are at complete risk of collapsing. Worldwide, and even here in our farmer's market, we see farmers are struggling to keep up with shifting weather patterns and increasingly unpredictable water supplies and hot weather, flooding, and other extreme weather events damage our infrastructure, putting heavy burdens on electrical supplies, and disrupting how we travel, how we commute, how we go about our everyday lives. Second, we know that while all of these changes impact all of us, the effects are felt unequally around the world with developing nations and thousands of communities here in the U.S. disproportionately bearing the burden. These communities, often low income, many with residents of color, constantly grapple with issues that others seldom encounter with the same intensity. These include exposure to air pollutants, like particulate matter and soot produced from burning fossil fuels, or soil and water contamination caused by dumping coal ash or lead in the water supply. 
these same communities tend to be systemically targeted when corporations and regulators decide where to build a hazardous waste plant, a power plant, or a waste incinerator. And it doesn't help that these populations often lack access to fresh produce, health insurance, affordable homes, public transportation, and economic opportunities. It is indeed impossible to separate climate justice from racial and economic justice. And third, while we might argue about the exact causes of how we got to the present, the good news, and in fact the best news, is that we know we have the power to change the future. Paul's opening in the letter to Timothy regarding his ministry in Ephesus reminds us that no matter how ignorant, how arrogant, or how destructive our past behavior may have been, God's mercy and grace is still available to us as we understand the error of our ways, and here's the key, change them. It's important to take responsibility for and lament the harm that we collectively have done to the planet. We must educate ourselves on the big and small ways that we actively and passively contribute to the destabilization of the web of life. We must identify patterns of institutionalized environmental racism, recognizing that it is the people of color and those who contribute to the crisis the least who are hit the most, culminating in a doubling or tripling of the oppression. But most importantly, we must act. And not just once, because even though one action <coughs> is important, it's not enough. Our actions need to continue to grow and expand, and in doing so, we can indeed change our current trajectory. Amen. Last week, Pastor Michelle <laughs> lifted up some of the challenges and costs that come with choosing to follow Christ in living out the message of the gospel. And Maureen reminded us that some of the costs of pursuing our dreams are tangible, for instance, if I want to learn to play the piano, I need to acquire access to a piano and an instructor. But some of the costs are intangible, although no less significant. And in fact, these often turn out to be the biggest barriers to achieving our aspirations. For example, if I have a beautiful piano and an awesome instructor, but I don't invest the time to practice, chances are I will never be a very good pianist. And I speak from experience on that one. <laughs> when I was in elementary school, I decided I wanted to learn to play the piano. I wasn't particularly interested in trying to become a professional musician. I didn't really have any long-term lofty goals. I just wanted to play the piano because I liked listening to music, and I thought it would be great to be able to make music. My desire was strong enough and sincere enough that my parents bought a lovely, slightly used, upright piano and found a good, and more importantly, extremely patient piano teacher for me, Mr. Scott. So as I began my journey with weekly lessons and instructions for daily practice, and I was pretty enthusiastic at first, probably because it was something new. In the beginning, the piano pieces were short and simple. It was easy for me to be successful. And frankly, every time I practiced, I could tell I was getting better. I was pretty pleased with myself, kind of proud of my progress, and so was Mr. Scott. And that motivated me to keep practicing and to keep growing. I couldn't wait until I was able to play my favorite songs from the radio effortlessly, which would be fun for me and my friends, and I envisioned being able to do impromptu entertainment anytime I saw an accessible piano. But over time, the process became more challenging and frustrating. I was no longer able to see instant progress each time I practiced. And so I began to practice less. Mr. Scott also seemed to become more demanding. He wanted me to practice longer each day, pay attention to how I positioned my hands. 
And this was the deal breaker. Keep my fingernails cut short. <laughs> I resisted making those changes, and perhaps not surprisingly, I stopped making progress. I stopped growing as a piano player because I wasn't willing to adjust to my priorities, silly as that may seem. Instead, I stopped taking piano lessons and focused on making music as a member of the children's choir at my church. Luckily, I had another readily available option for me, so this story has a happy ending. But sadly, that's not always the case. As we grow in our discipleship, we learn more, we understand more, and ideally we begin to reevaluate our priorities to better align with our call to love God with all our heart, mind, and soul, and to love our neighbor, including all of creation, as ourselves. Here at Pilgrim, our green team has helped us tremendously prioritize reducing waste by encouraging us to use sustainable and compostable products and very patiently coaching us on how to dispose of our trash. And their impact has gone beyond our congregation to impact all who use our building, shop at the farmer's market, and attend the food truck rally. And if you're like me, I'm sure some of those efforts have had a positive impact on your individual behaviors at home. I channel Cleo pretty constantly when I'm running water or thinking about taking my, my reusable bags to the store. Today's text from Jeremiah, however, raises the question as to whether my response, our response, to the current crisis is sufficient. Greta Thunberg, the 16-year-old Swedish activist who arrived in the U.S. last week after sailing across the Atlantic to avoid carbon emissions from jet travel, was asked when she became so passionate about climate change. She says it started before she was 10 years old during a school lesson that, as she recalls, made the entire class very sad. She says, we saw these horrifying pictures of plastic in the oceans and floodings and so on, and everyone was very moved by that. But then it just seemed like everyone went back to normal. And I couldn't go back to normal because those pictures were stuck in my head, and I couldn't just go on knowing that this was happening in the world. So she began researching the issue, reading about climate science, and asking questions. And her sense of activism grew. She became an activist, attending marches, talking to people inside the environmental movement. And when the pace seemed to slow, rather than quitting, she hit on the idea of a school strike, and a new movement was born. This coming Friday, people all over the planet are going on strike. Millions of people are expected to walk out of school, out of work, of the averageness of their days to make a clear and unequivocal statement to the leaders of the world, act on climate now. I share this story not because I'm advocating that you join the climate strike, although you might find it interesting to, to Google and learn more about it, nor am I suggesting that each of us has to go start a global movement. But I do hope that, like Greta, each of us will come to understand that we can't go back to normal knowing what is happening in the world. And that will motivate us to make better and better choices each day. Even if it's inconvenient, or slightly more expensive, or time consuming. May we have the courage and discipline to listen to the true prophets of our time. Amen.